our theme verse for the month. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go there. It is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 that I want to call your attention to today. But I do want to, to uh, give you the question as the great, our great Lord and Savior presents it to those who are following him. He has just begun his earthly ministry good, and here is what he asks to those who are following him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not practice what I tell you? That is the question that he asks to those who are calling him Lord, and it is from that question that we pulled or extrapolated this theme for the month, think about it. It is not a question to just ask flippant, answer flippantly, to just run by and say, hey, he didn't know what he was asking. We're just going to say, hey, he, he was just saying something. Pause, think about it. Why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't practice what I ask you to practice? All right, that's the thought. Then the next question for us then became, this month, let's unpack some of the things he commanded or asked us to do. And that's what we've been doing this month. And so the last thing that I want you to think about that he has asked us to do is found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. In the Amplified, it reads this way. Jesus approached and breaking the silence, said to them, all authority, all power or rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here's the command, go then and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age, amen, so let it be. And so our subtopic for today, as we think about the command of our risen Savior, is our subtopic is leading the world back to Jesus. Everybody shout, help me lead the world. Lead the world where? That's what we're going to talk about. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I put this in your notes to those who are following us on your monitors via live stream. I put this as an opening thought in your notes, and it just simply says this. Every person needs to be introduced to Jesus. How many of you believe that? How many of you are better because someone introduced you to Jesus Christ? How many of you are grateful that someone introduced you to Jesus Christ? How many of you know how important it is to be introduced to Jesus Christ? Yeah, it is pretty important stuff to be introduced to Jesus Christ. Brother Drummond, I'm so glad you were introduced to Jesus Christ. It is that introduction that led to your introduction to your beautiful wife. And that's right, that's something to clap about. That's right, that's something to clap about. He has reminded us that he found a real walk with Jesus Christ inside of our doors. He did not know him the way we are trying to get you to know him. Partly because for, for, for the average man, he is okay with, with people, you know, jumping and screaming and everything. But at some point, he needs to his mind to be activated and to just sort of be able to rationalize why we're jumping and screaming. He needs to be able to put some meat on the bones every now and then. Ladies looking at me like, y'all don't, you don't think I need to put some meat on the bones? I'm glad you do. That's why you're here, ladies. I'm not trying to push it off on you. I'm telling you that this brother had, he had communicated to us that he thought church was just hype. And then he found that, no, there's some substance to it if we take the time to think about it. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. Would you do me a favor and just shout back at me, Pastor White? We recognize now that church is more than hype. Yes, it is. It is substance. And the reason you must know that is because Jesus, again, this great uh, Savior that we follow, he said that you cannot just hear me teach and then, and then go out and live contrary to my teachings. That's why he asked us, why would you call me Lord and not do what I ask? I asked you in our opening series, why would you go to the doctor, Pastor White, ask him to do surgery on your back, Pastor White, and then not do what he tell you to do afterwards? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Why would you call me doctor, doctor, and you're not going to follow what I ask you or what I prescribe for you? Are y'all listening to me? 
Yeah, but we do it all the time. We find people in our lives, we tell them, I want your counsel. We can say, you're a counselor, counselor, and then we don't follow their advice. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? It's hard. It is hard. I can, I can just feel Jesus as he asked the question. Why would you be in here yelling and screaming, saying, I'm your Lord, and you know when you leave here, you're going to live life contrary to how, I, how I've asked you to live it. It's just real up in your face, and it's something to think about. Everybody shout, it is. Therefore, because every person needs to be introduced to Jesus, therefore, God calls every one of us to take on the responsibility of leading the world back to himself. How? One soul at a time. How many of us should be doing this? How many of us should be doing this? It's not a trick question. Everybody can answer. How many of us should be doing this? What is it that we should be doing? Leading the world. So in our initial message, I asked you to think about this, and I just put it back, and it was just this question that I asked you to think about, and it is, are you leading those with whom you have influence, friend and foe, to follow Jesus? Now, I don't want you to just overlook that, because if you do, if you just scroll by that, you'll be like, yeah, I'm trying to influence my friends. I did not ask you only about your friends. Are you leading those that consider you an adversary or an enemy by the way you treat them even if they don't treat you right. See, it is, it is deep pondering, it is deep thought, because it is so easy in our culture, in our world today, to repay evil for evil. It is something that we feel we have a right to do, and maybe we do and from an earthly perspective, but not from a heavenly perspective. And the one thing that the gospel of Jesus Christ does is it comes to challenge all of us to elevate our thinking, to elevate our actions beyond just earthly means or earthly um, reactions or earthly thoughts. He challenges us to think from a plane that allows us to be to the world what the world needs to become, but it can't become if we who are following Christ are not first it in, in demonstration and in modeling. So then, are you leaving? Leading the world back to Jesus, friend and foe, not just friends. Are you listening to me? What do you mean, Pastor White? When people disagree with you, do you have to become disagreeable too? When people cut you off, do you need to now go and cut the next person off riding down the road? When people give you bad service at a restaurant, do that, does that now give you license to now try and take their job? I don't know, but at some point, we have to ask ourselves, what is different about the way we respond and lead the world if we are true leaders in this thing called Christendom? And if we react and respond to everything that happens to us the same way that the world does, then the question must be asked by those who follow Christ and those who don't, what difference does he make? I have not come to play games in my walk with Christ. I have come to live my life differently than I would have lived it had I not encountered him. And I have come as your pastor to challenge you to allow him to cause you to live life differently than you would have lived it had you never encountered him. And in our world today, there is a void of leadership. There is a void of men and women who wake up every day with a serious conviction about how life should be lived. Which means then that whoever gets the microphone can influence those who have no true conviction by their, I was going to, by, by however they feel. Let's say it that way. I want to, <laughs> by however they feel and whatever they're saying. And so what you see in our culture is men and women being tossed to and fro by whoever the leader is and whatever they feel at that moment. And then we all rally around and we put no thought to how we feel about it and everybody just jumps in. One side on one side, another side on the other side, never considering that on both sides, whatever argument you want to present are brothers and sisters who have been redeemed by the same blood you've been redeemed by. And we set up against one another, not even considering how this will reflect on the name we proclaim. How, how does the world get back to Jesus 
if those of us who follow him turn against one another based on cultural and social arguments. It is this complex type of thinking that led Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, to say to his followers, here's my command to you. It is real complex, so don't miss it. It is greater than just the Great Commission. The Great Commission is complex. It is real deep, and here it is. The world has a leadership vacuum. Everyone who follows me must carry this mandate, go into the world, and lead them back to me one soul at a time. That is the commission. That is what you and I have been asked to do. So no matter what we do in our time here today, the greater question is what will we do when we leave here today? And even if you don't have a title in church, the question is, will your name matter in the earth? And if we give you no title, people are looking to you for leadership, and they are hoping that you will respond differently even when they're responding out of their emotions. The world is, is devoid of leadership. The world is devoid of leadership. Y'all say it with me. So let's talk about what, what leadership looks like. Let's talk about some evidences of Christian leadership because I want you to know what it is you should be doing as you lead the world back to Jesus one soul at a time. Ever shot? I'm ready to do this, Pastor White. Y'all convince me. I'm ready to. What you ready to do? Because everybody deserves to be introduced to who? Yeah, they might not make it to your family. They might not make it to your mom and daddy. But everybody deserves to be introduced to Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Just like, hold on for a minute. Before I take you there, because y'all don't believe me, y'all act like that, that I am talking to you about some common dude. Y'all act like, like, like if I said, everybody need to be, who's the most popular artist out right now? Let's, let's see who. Lil Wayne, if I said everybody need to be introduced to Lil Wayne, y'all be like, oh yeah, where he gonna be at? <laughs> or if I said everybody need to be introduced to, to JC and Yancey, y'all be like, oh yeah, where they gonna be at? Or if I said everybody should be introduced to Barack and Michelle Obama, y'all be like, oh yeah, where they gonna be at? And then I say to you, that, that's cool. Y'all have admiration for who you have admiration for. But think about this. Everybody should be introduced to Jesus Christ. And y'all just sit there like, whatever, dude. Can, women, can you speed this up? Didn't you say they only give you 30 minutes? I did, but y'all cannot make it like I'm talking about some average guy. Y'all can't, y'all can't act like that, that, that if we can introduce somebody to Jesus today, that that's just an everyday introduction. That's life-changing stuff. That's radical stuff if I can get you to Jesus. So in Sunday morning discipleship training, and I think I'm going to go on my 30 minutes if y'all don't help me out here. In Sunday morning discipleship training, um, um, Hannah asked the question. She wanted to know what is different from one religion to the other. What, all of them seem to teach the, you know, good morals and everything. Why is it that Christianity is so different and why do we proclaim to be the truth as opposed to a truth? It's basically the essence of the question. To which we try to explain in brevity, and I want you to consider this, that every religion on the planet offers you good ideas for how you should live life and treat one another. Only one distinct, it distinguishes itself from all of the others, and this is why. Christianity is the only religion that says to you that you don't have to be good enough to get the favor of God. Every other religion says to you, you must live good enough, you must walk upright enough in order to curry God's favor. And every one of us, if we embrace that idea, know when we look in the mirror that we fail today on being good enough to stand in the presence of a holy God. So what's different about Christianity? It's the only religion that offers us a remedy to our sin problem. 
Christianity offers us someone who could live up to the expectations of heaven, Jesus Christ. And he lived up to that expectation by living a perfect life and then being lynched for no wrong of his own. He was beaten and bullied and beaten and crucified. And the Bible says, Isaiah 53, he was literally beaten till there was no form of comeliness to his face. He was beaten beyond recognition. The question becomes, why was he beaten so badly? And what should we take from his beating? He was beaten so badly because the wages, the consequences for your imperfection and my imperfection are death. It is the wrath of a holy God poured out on you without mercy. Jesus Christ stepped in and said, I will live perfectly, die shamefully, and I will drink the cup of my daddy's wrath without mercy so that you, every one of you, every one of you can drink from the cup of mercy without wrath. Hallelujah. 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 And to know him is to know mercy. Hallelujah. And to know him is to know grace. Hallelujah. And to know him is to know forgiveness. Hallelujah. And to know him is to know joy. Hallelujah. And to know him is to know life. To know him is to know purpose. And to know him is to have a reason for breathing. So every person should be introduced to him. He is the guy that the world wants you to think badly of because he says, I'm the way. And many of you are wrestling with it. I don't make sense. Don't make sense. Why can't he be the only way? I don't know. But just think about this. If a house were on fire, if it were on fire, and one of us were in the house, and the house were caving in, and we had to get out, can you bring this to me? And although there are many doors, just bring it here, right here. Yeah. Yep, right there. Just put it right there, probably, right? Yep, just put it in the door. I don't care how. Can it, can it sit outside? Can the cross go? Yeah, just in the door. There you go. Right there, right there, right there, in the door. Uh huh. Just let it come back. Now pull the door up. Pull the door up. House on fire. House burning down. All of us in the house. One man gets out. One man gets out. Radio's back in. Everybody. Everybody. I left the door open to get out. I left the way out of the house. Don't go out that door. No, there's danger there. It's going to cave in that way. You have to come this way. How many of us would stand in here with a way out and say, we don't want to take that way. We want to go this way. That would be foolish. The house is about to cave in. He left you a way out. He's a hero. But I say he's a hero. He hadn't caused you harm. He's a hero. And so then, let's go this way. I don't like that way. Why well, you going to die the other way? Let's just go this way. It's, there's a way out here. So do me a favor and shake your half-sleep neighbor and tell them Jesus Christ should be introduced to everybody in the world because he offers the way out. The way out, he offers it. Don't get mad at him. Celebrate him. He offers the way out. He offers the way out. 
If you had a way, you would have offered it. I know you would have because you love people. And now you have a way. Give it to them. He offers the way out. Hallelujah. I want to pause for the cause and give heaven a great big O. If he brought you out, let's just bless him like we love him real quick. The door is propped open by the cross of Jesus Christ for everybody you encounter this week. They deserve, they deserve to be introduced to him because he and he alone can offer them a way out of the misery and the pain and the hopelessness that this world offers to her inhabitants. Hallelujah. All right. Y'all have it? Because I was thinking, y'all were thinking I was just, just talking and just like, well, I don't know, but I'm just telling you that every day I wake up, I just look over and I see it. And I was like, whoo, whoo, wee, 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 wee. I know I'm going to encounter people who don't like your way, but oh, Lord, I'm so grateful. I mean, he could have shut the door. He could have said, y'all aren't worth it. He could have said, you know what? I'm going to let them stay in there. They, they crucified me. They mocked me. They rejected me. I'm going to let them stay in there and burn. But he says, no, no, I'm too loving. I'm too kind. I'm too merciful. And I'm going to give them away. And then those who have found a way allow people who don't have a real argument to make you feel guilty about trying to get them to what you found. The world is the void of real leadership. And saints of God, we must fill that void. That was the whole message of Matthew 28. The world is the void of leadership, people. Go to the world and reach them. Three evidences of Christian leadership. Christian leaders share the vision of the gospel or the vision the gospel brings on how to live life in this fallen world. Jesus says, go into all the world and baptize men and women in Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, go into all the world. He says, and I want you to make disciples of all nations. What a vision. What a vision, what a vision that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter who you did it with, no matter where on the planet you are, no matter where you are on that map that's up there, you can become a disciple of Christ. Who? 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 That changed my life, y'all. That changed my life. I've been studying at the feet of the wrong folk. I had become a disciple of the wrong group, a disciple of Christ, that vision for my life. You wipe all your stains, all your failures, all your mishaps can become a disciple of the resurrected Christ. What a vision. No wonder how many people in your life need to know that no matter what they've done, that the gospel of Jesus Christ offers them a whole new vision of life. While everybody's looking at how ugly they are and how messed up they are, God is looking how beautiful and how wonderful those who are blood washed are. Because he does not look at us based on our own merits. He looks, he looks at us based on the merits of his son. And his son was perfect. And so his perfection is imputed or credited to my account. So that when you and I stand before him, he looks at us through blood-stained lenses. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something. That people you'll encounter this week, they will envision themselves as everything itself for what Jesus says they can be. And many of you in here may look in the mirror and you may be reminded over and over of what you're not. And that's okay, as long as you don't buy into that vision. The vision that God offers us is one that is glorious. It's one where lives that have been used running away from God 
will now be utilized to follow him. Go and make disciples. That's our command. That's heaven's vision. You, a true disciple of Christ. But you don't know what I've done. I'm glad you said that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, since it is the vision of heaven to make you a Jesus follower, a disciple of Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hallelujah. 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 Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. So I asked you, I gave you this uh, quote to think about, I think it was, um, um, and I think about, it's not up there, yeah, and it just is this, our vision is so limited, we can hardly imagine a love that does not, does not show itself in protection from suffering. Now listen to what is being communicated. Our vision is so limited, we can hardly imagine a love that does not show itself in protection from suffering. Now listen good, because I want you to see the vision of heaven. The love of God did not protect his own son. He will not necessarily protect us. Not from anything it takes to make us like his son. A lot of hammering and chiseling and purifying by fire will have to go into the process. Thank you, Elizabeth Elliot, for that quote. She said, we can't, we can't even envision love that doesn't protect us from every ill the world offers. He says, but if you walk in this way, you will have to consider his love didn't even protect his own son. Do you really think he's going to keep you from stuff that will chisel you and purify you and make you more like his son? Stop getting caught up in emotions. And start thinking about it. Hallelujah. God's vision for you is one where you will go through floods. You will go through fires. You will go through storms. And they will not consume you. But will purify you. And make you a greater Jesus follower than you would have been had you never gone through it. Hallelujah. Number two. So now that I, I have a clearer vision, Christian leaders... They lend their voice to the gospel message. They lend their to the gospel message. Matthew 28 and 20. You see those mics? You see how many of them are empty? That's the way it is when it comes to Christian leadership in our world. Lots of mics and no one stepping up to them. He says, go into all the world. He says, show them that they can be Jesus followers also. And once they catch that vision, use your voice to teach them. Use your voice to teach them. Well, I don't know it. You're going to have to learn it so you can teach them. You're going to have to study to show yourself approved so you can teach them. They have to be taught. You have to be willing to learn so that you can teach them. But I don't want to take the time to do it. You have to because everybody deserves to be introduced to Jesus. And it is your command. It is my command for you, saith the Lord, that you lead the world back to me one soul at a time. And in order to do so, you will have to teach them. Hey, everybody, shout, I got it. Say it again. I got it. My voice can't be used to promote Lil Wayne's message. My voice can't be used to promote Jay-Z and Yancey's message. I mean, it's good to dance to, but come on, sooner or later, we got to stop dancing and start living. I mean, I know you can nay-nay to it, but sooner or later, we got to stop nay-naying and running, man, and we got to live this thing out. So now the question becomes, when the music stops, whose voice is most clear? Whose message brings most, the most clarity to life? And I submit to you that it is the gospel message that brings most clarity to life. Therefore, we must learn it so that we can lend our voice to it. Hallelujah. So I put in your notes. This Psalm, Psalms 47, I won't read it all, but it says that I want you to do something, and that is in Psalms 47, verse 1, it says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye peoples. Shout to God with what kind of voice? What kind of voice? The voice of triumph. God says, whatever you do, do not lend your voice to victimization and pity. 
I have come to make you triumphant. I have come to give you a new identity in the earth. Your voice must be the voice of a triumphant group. But you don't understand what I'm going through. Do you not understand who you're going through it with? Think about it. And so then, I think about it for our voice is just this simple. Think about this. The enemy desires for Christians to be silent about their faith, while at the same time, God desires for Christians to be vocal about their faith. In short, your voice matters. Now sit down and be quiet if you want to. I'm just telling you, it matters. Dr. King said in one of his speeches, he says, that we will not only have to apologize for the appalling silence, I mean for the appalling evil of the bad people, but we'll also have to apologize for the appalling silence, he said, of the good people. Dr. King said, in his perspective, silence breeds consent. He said that to those of you who are leading, to not lend your voice to what's right, to not give your voice to a message that is bigger than you, is to sit back and watch people die when you could have helped them. And he said, when they asked him, why are you in Birmingham? This is where he was writing from, Birmingham jail. They said, why are you in Birmingham, Dr. King? Why are you not back where, where you've been liberated and where you get to enjoy all you get to enjoy? And Dr. King said, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is in Birmingham. And he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. Your voice matters. You say, what are you telling me? I need to become a politician. No, just a Christian. That uses your voice to lead people back to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number three, Christian leaders walk in victory while leading in life. They walk in while live, leading in life. How do we walk while leading in life? How do we walk? In Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus says, he says, I want you to do this. I want you to go into all the world. I want you to teach all men. And he says, I want you, I mean, he said, I want you to baptize them. I want you to make them Jesus followers. He says, then I want you to use your force to teach them. He says, oh, and by the way, I'm with you the whole way. In other words, this reminder that this is not a place where you will walk in defeat, but rather in victory. I am victory all by itself. Lo, I'm with you. Always. When they lie on you and try to beat you and try to scandalize you, it's all good. I've already conquered it. I'm with you. The greatest victor the world has ever known says, I'm with you. Now he says, lead. Now he says, lead. They're not going to like me. That's okay. They didn't lead. They didn't like me. But I'm with you. And they didn't like me, but they can't deny me. Because I did what no one else could do. I'm the only man, listen good, I'm the only man that ever lived, then died, and is still living. And I'm with you. But they threatening to kill me. You are with the one who got up. It's all good. They can't stop us. This is victory on the move. This is victorious living at its best. There is no victory outside of him because only he gives an answer for the grave. And whatever you can conquer in life and on your own, you cannot conquer the grave without him. He's the greatest victor the world has ever known. And he leaves away. And he says, you're my followers. Walk in that victory. Now, one of the reasons the world is so devoid of leadership is because the world always offers us victimization as an, as an option. And it does so by offering us all the time, every time something happens, why, 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 why? Sometimes the why never comes. But I do know this, that you and I are more than conquerors. And sometimes sitting around trying to figure out the why to everything will paralyze us. 
Sometimes we have to make up our minds that I'm not sure why it happened. I'm just sure that it did happen, and it's not going to keep happening. And victors get up and march forward. Nay, in all things, we are more than, we're more than conquerors. You say, but you don't know what I'm going through, Pastor White. I do know who's going through it with you. But you don't know what I'm dealing with, Pastor White. I do know that it is not greater than he who is in you. But you don't know my struggles, Pastor White. But he does. And he thought you were worth dying for. So I put in the next passage of scripture. I told you, I said, I want you to think about this. There is no true testimony without a test. How many of you believe that? And there is no victory without a fight or battle. I want to announce to everyone in here that you will not be victorious without engaging in some battles. So stop crying over them. Stop holding your head down about it. For every person that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, we've been redeemed because we were in the fight of our life. We just were losing. He showed up to make us winners. He showed up because he was not going to allow life or the devil or the grave to claim victory over his followers any longer. And if you are in him, that victory is yours every day of your life. Even when you feel broke down, even when you feel wounded by life, even when tears are coming, his victory is your victory. And if you can just put your mind on that, if you can just think about that, you win right there. Afflicted, but still winning. Hurting, but still winning. That's your gift. That's what you've been tasked with sharing with the world. Our victory. Our vision. And lending your voice to it. Because every person in the world deserves to be introduced to the resurrected Jesus Christ. Because he has a different vision for how life should be lived. He needs a few voices, though, to, lead, to be lent to his message. So that the world and those that you encounter this week will understand that victory can be theirs like it is yours. Every hour.